imposter syndrome. Well, we've all been there. I remember once being interviewed on BBC Radio and I felt like the biggest fake going. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, you know, who was I, some two-bit writer, to be on the radio? And I think for anyone creative who's putting their work out into the world, I think it's even worse. As writers, we're making worlds. We've got characters we're in love with and we're writing our novels. Then we get to that point where we become self-critical. I'm not good enough we say. Um, somebody's probably already told this story better than me. I'm going to get rejected. I'm going to get terrible reviews and that means I'm going to get terrible sales. So if you're experiencing that, what can you do to help yourself through those times? Hi, I'm Stuart Wakefield, an author accelerator, certified book coach and writer. With 26 years in theatre, broadcast media, and coaching under my belt, I know what makes stories work. And I love to share that with other writers, because the world of storytelling is like the ocean. It's deep, it's mysterious, and it's a little scary to those who don't know how to navigate it. And with so much left to luck and timing, it's my mission to give great books the best chance of getting into readers' hands. In each episode, I'll share tips and plans of action that will help you write, edit, and publish your book. If you're new to writing or consciously working to improve your craft, then this is the podcast for you. Hello, I'm Stuart, and in this episode, I'm going to be talking about imposter syndrome and what we can do about it. I'm going to cover the feelings we get and the stories we tell ourselves that hold us back, and then coping strategies for both. Thinking I'm not good enough. Okay, so first, if you thought you were the only person who thought that, if you were the only person who felt that, you would be in a lab somewhere and the government would be experimenting on your brain because not feeling good enough is the inner cry of every soul. It's the human condition. Um, when somebody says to you, oh, I like your t-shirt, and you go, oh, it's only H&M, you're not even acknowledging that the clothes you're wearing are suitable. You're constantly deflecting and pushing things away. You're investing time in worrying about things that haven't happened yet. And what you don't do is lift your head up and look back. And that's the key thing. When you look back, you see where you were and then where you are now and you see what you've achieved, those little wins. And it's really important that you mark them. So I know it sounds a bit twee, but I want you to get a jar and then stick a label on it that says the truth about your writing. And when somebody compliments you or your writing, I want you to smile, maintain eye contact and say, thank you. Then later, write down their compliment, pop it in your jar. And then when you're feeling discouraged, open the jar and read every slip of paper because I want you to think I'm not a terrible writer. And that jar, full of little successes, is going to become an enormous boost when you're feeling down. So what have you built? Have you built a metal wall or have you built a picket fence? So the idea isn't to get rid of imposter syndrome, because if you did, you'd be like Donald Trump. Now, love him or hate him, he's totally authentic and has zero vulnerability. I'm not even sure the word weakness is in his vocabulary. But with imposter syndrome, the idea isn't to take it down so you have no vulnerability, but to take it down from an impenetrable metal wall to a white picket fence so you can notice it, recognise it, then step over it. You need to be self-critical to look objectively at your work and say, OK, this isn't working and this is how I can fix it. But when that becomes too much, that's when it pushes you down and you have this I'm not good enough feeling. Another strategy is really understanding who it's for and what it's for. If who it's for is yourself, then you can never not be good enough. If you want to write something and then criticise yourself, you may as well look a toad. Uh, <laughs> that's miserable. Go and do that instead. But if who it's for is not you, then, and only then, you're accountable to your audience. And this touches on last episode when we talked about, you know, identifying your ideal reader. Because knowing who you are delivering for is really important. Because you're not the best judge of whether it's good enough, because it's not for you. 
So getting clear on who it's for is important and tying that in with the feeling of I'm not good enough. So here's the thing. Good enough for what? And who is this person who's measuring people's worth? I haven't met them. And also we tend to tie self-worth to achievement. And that's where I'm not good enough comes from. We tie in what we do with how good we are. Your brain's a liar. And that voice is saying, I'm not good enough. And that voice will constantly be there. So if you can ignore it, you can take heart from it. Because remember who your story is for and then ask them if it's good. If you get into your own head, you're done. You're finished. Writing is a gift for you and it's a gift for others. So have a think about the audience. I once had a beta reader tell me she didn't like my main character. And I obviously focused my entire book on his side of a romantic relationship. And I thought I'd written him as feisty, but she just read him as angry. And my first thought was, I'm terrible. Um, You know, I can't even write a sympathetic character. Uh, In the UK, we had a TV show called Family Fortunes. I think in the US it's called Family Feud. Anyway, 100 people are surveyed with everyday questions. So name something you'd spread on toast. And contestants had to guess the top answers those 100 people gave. So you could ask 100 people who read your book what they didn't like. And 21 might dislike what your main character said to the undertaker in chapter one. 13 might dislike your description of a papaya in chapter four. And 33 hated the fact that the wedding was held on a beach because they went to a stunning ski resort ceremony where the theme was frozen. Um, So what I'm getting at is there's a difference between writing for other people and pleasing everybody. And as much as who your story is for, There are those it's not for, and those people might pick up your book, hate it, and write a scathing review. Now, if 100 readers came back and hated your main character, you're onto something, and that's feedback worth paying attention to, but it really is a numbers game. And anyway, can you really write something that everybody hates? People are weird. Uh, There's someone to like everything you do. And judging your work on one person's reaction or a very small number of people's reactions, it's not the healthy thing to do. Don't let emotional you win. There are two voices in your head and there's more than one side of the story. But when you get feedback, congratulate yourself on being brave because you put it out there. Most people wouldn't do that because they fear, what if I'm not good enough? So here's a conversation between emotional you and rational you. Emotional you. Oh my God, I'm an awful writer. Rational you. Well, you know, it's just one person's point of view. Emotional you. Yeah, but it's terrible. I wanted them to like it and they didn't like it. So I have to stop writing forever. Rational you. That's one option. But here's another one. So let's be honest. There's no if you're going to fail. Of course you are. Do you really want to be the only human on the planet who doesn't fail? It's never going to happen. You are going to fail. You're better investing your energy in when this manuscript comes back and I have negative comments, what is my strategy going to be? How are you going to navigate that perceived failure and use that failure rung on your ladder as it takes you to success? Dealing with rejection. When an agent rejects your book, please remember, it's not a judgment on you as a human being. It's more likely to be a judgment on what's working right now, on what's selling. If you ask most agents why they came into the publishing industry, they'll probably tell you it's to find an undiscovered genius. But they're not going to get paid unless they find a book that's marketable. There's so much more at play. So judging the creative value of something against someone who has targets and is part of a commercial machine, to me, that doesn't make sense. It's possible for creative people to lose that perspective. If you want to pursue traditional publishing, that agent is going to ask you to make changes to your book so a publisher will be interested. And once a publisher is interested, they're probably going to ask you to make changes to your book so the public will be interested. So there's this mind shift you need to make from this is my passion project to, okay, so this needs to be something marketable so it sells. 
As a book coach, I'm always going to encourage people to publish a great manuscript because their story is so many other people's story. Your story might be the one thing that gives someone that element of agency, so I think it's selfish not to share it. Books, they are a little bit like babies. Uh, They start inside you and you spend a long time making them. And then when you give birth, Uh, someone comes along and says your baby is fat and ugly and looks like a football. Uh, According to my sister, I look like a pickled onion. Um, So, of course, you want to lock yourself away because this thing just came out of you and somebody is telling you it's absolutely hideous. Of course, you want to lock yourself in a room. Listen, I could quote you my one-star reviews word for word. My five-star reviews, I couldn't quote you a single one. So you're doing yourself a disservice. Your one-star reviews are like Velcro. They'll stick to your brain, whereas the five-star reviews could be Velcro, but we dismiss them because our inner voice, when somebody says something good, we go back, oh, no, it's only H&M. If you don't have a way of being able to notice and describe, adding no judgment, your reviews, they're going to own you. And what the world loses if you give up is your words. You're actually stealing the opportunity for people to grow because you're giving up. Don't let fear drive your bus. Becoming a writer is a choice. I am a writer does not require agreement from the Writers Guild of America or insert your country's name here. When people say, one day I'd like to write a book, what they're actually saying is, I am not a writer. I feel like I have a story in me. But as up to this moment, I have not yet been brave enough to even consider putting it down. The truth that they want to write, it keeps coming out. Oh my gosh, one day I'll write a book, but I'm not brave enough. And I think that other thing's more important. I don't have time. My job doesn't allow for it. It's going to be rubbish anyway. All of that external loci of control erodes their creativity, their own ability to be fulfilled. We set these upper limits of success around our identities. So only you can achieve what you believe you deserve. If you keep telling yourself, I'm not good enough, try this. Up until now, I haven't felt good enough. Do you see the difference? Because every time you say, I'm not good enough, it's another brick in the wall of shutting off your creativity. So please don't let fear drive your bus. Before I wrap up, I invite you to do all the usual stuff like like, review, share and subscribe. But better than all of that, come and visit me at thebookcoach.co. Sign up for my free self-editing guide and take a look at the services I provide. But there's tons of free useful stuff on my blog too. Okay, so I'm not sure if that was a how-to so much as a manifesto or maybe a call to arms, but I hope you found something useful and inspiring. Uh, If you haven't started writing, please get on and start. If you're already writing, please keep on doing it. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day and well done for investing some time in your own writing life. And yes, this podcast is about writing, but I'm here for you, not just your story. 